coming up on show 845, the Mercedes-Benz EQS, the electric sedan that'll get over 435 miles of range. Stick around, I'll tell you more. Plus on the podcast today, Xpeng raises more money. Leasing begins on the Tesla Model Y. Also, the semi-truck looks like it's going to be getting closer. And a new charging service from Volkswagen. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening around the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, the edition for Monday, the 20th of July. My name is Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story so you don't have to. Thank you, as always, to the gang at myev.com. Special thank you at the beginning of the show today uh, for them. Uh, they have built the world's first marketplace for EVs. If you're in the US, do check them out at myev.com. They really do simplify the whole process of learning and buying and selling electric cars. On to the headline story today, then, the Mercedes-Benz EQS, electric sedan with great mileage. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, Daimler's AGM, the annual general meeting, uh, organised this month was pretty unconventional because it was all online, as many things are these days. Ola Kalenius is the main man there and talked about the COVID outbreak and taking its toll on car sales and also talked about the new Mercedes-Benz S-Class and the new Mercedes-Benz EQS, the all-electric, and reiterated that it will be a car developed from the ground up as an EV and not be a conversion of the S-Class, which debuts this September, but rather its own car. Well, the EQS debuted in concept form last year. The production version is going to have great mileage, they say. They've managed to ensure that the design of the car is such that it will deliver 435 miles, that is 700 kilometres, thanks to batteries manufactured in-house at Daimler's Stuttgart Unterturkheim plant. I hope I've said that correct. According to Motor One, the Tesla Model S Long Range, uh, well, the Long Range Plus, they had to give it a new name, it's the same car, has uh, the world's first true 400-mile EV range. Will the Mercedes-Benz EQS equal it or even beat it? Well, they've got a couple of years to do it. It's technically the 2022 model year now. It was going to be the 2021, but now it's the 22 Mercedes-Benz EQS. So look, it's going to be at least 18 months away, do you reckon? That should be plenty of time for the Mercedes-Benz engineers to make sure that they can squeeze all the technology into the car that they need to. With a car that is big enough, with enough batteries, with good enough efficiency, it is no longer eye-wateringly hard to get 400 miles out of an EV. Like I said, this is a big platform, big luxurious car as the Mercedes-Benz EQS Think S-Class. And so, yep, it can be done. It's going to be tough, obviously. This isn't a walk in the park for Mercedes. It'll be, if they do 435 miles, that's 700 kilometers. That is going to be a great range to go out there with. It may not be the longest range EV on the market in 18 months. It almost certainly won't be but it's a really good number. Let's move on. Chinese EV maker Xpeng Motors, backed by the Alibaba Group, said today they'd raised $500 million in their latest fundraising round as enthusiasm builds for EVs from the likes of Tesla and NIO surging in recent months. Says Reuters today, Xpeng, led by the chief exec, He Xiaopeng, is making the, well, two models, actually. First of all, all electric, the G3. The G3 is an SUV, and then there's the P7, and that's a sedan, which is very much in the yeah, Model S, Audi, A4, A6 kind of market. But both of them with autonomous driving capabilities, and they're both coming out of the Chinese plants they have there. This extra funding enables Xpeng to develop further vehicle technologies, they say, particularly intelligent technologies. The company plans to have 200 showrooms in China by the end of the year. Well, the Tesla Long Range Model Y and the Performance Model Y, if you wanted one of those in your driveway but were struggling with making the numbers work, maybe Tesla have answered your problems here. The Long Range, which starts at about 50 grand, we're not going to argue over $10, are we? Uh, long Range is 50k, Performance is 60k. If you finance them through Tesla and use Tesla Finance, it'll be about 700 bucks a month over. 72 months with four and a half thousand dollars down it sits about two and a half percent apr on their finance however you can now choose if you want to to lease the model y leasing is definitely a very very popular option in the us the deal works out at 500 dollars a month that's over three years you put four and a half grand down 
10,000 miles a year lease, over three years, 500 bucks a month. Very, very common in the luxury vehicle segment. According to Inside EVs, uh, leasing is popular. Businesses lease all the time because... I don't know what your tax situation is like, but certainly here for businesses, leasing has some tax advantages in terms of it's not equipment that you own. It's treated more like a rental. So Tesla is taking advantage of this and adding another tool really to increase the demand of the Model Y. It means people who may not be able to afford an expensive car can fit the Model Y into their budget. Leases are very common for luxury vehicles. Zero percent interest, though, even financing a 50k car can have significant monthly payments and that's why maybe a lease will bring those monthly payments down just a little bit. Let's talk batteries CATL, Contemporary Amperex Technology Limited uh, they are currently China's largest battery manufacturer, they've got 28% of the global battery market and they confirmed today they will start shipping their new batteries for Tesla's Shanghai Gigafactory they're called LFP batteries and they are lithium iron phosphate batteries lfp and they're going to be used in the chinese made model 3 the entry level model 3 standard range plus says the website talk news now currently uh, the chinese model 3 gets the batteries from panasonic they've been the sole battery supplier uh, says talk news um and i must admit i didn't consider where the batteries came from for this early run of Model 3s out of China. I knew there was a deal with LG Chem and CATL. I uh, hadn't put the two and two together and put the realised Pan actually it was Panasonic, long-time partner of Tesla. I'd never actually... Oh, maybe I had. <laughs> maybe the brain fade uh, had kicked in. But it looks like these new cells from CATL, the LFP battery cells, shipping to Gigafactory Shanghai this month in July. And even though LFP technology, they are prismatic battery packs. So... I'm trying to dis dis describe these. Uh, not a million miles away from a 12-volt battery that you would traditionally see in a car. That kind of size and shape. Uh, they're square, hard on the outside. They're not, like the, not like the pouch cells you may have seen. Not like the small cylindrical cells that Tesla normally use. These cells can be a little bit harder to cool. They can have lower energy density than the Panasonic nickel cobalt aluminium uh, the nca cells or lg chems nmc cells nickel manganese cobalt uh, which tesla uses but you get comparable range with the new lfp cells and also uh, if you have a larger battery pack because the way that the standard range plus battery pack works with tesla is there was a little bit of spare space in there uh, so Maybe they're using the extra space. Maybe they're using CATL's cell-to-pack technology. So rather than making cells into modules and modules into batteries, they're skipping the middle bit. Either way, that is now underway. And staying with Tesla, an employee of the company based at the Nevada Gigafactory has indicated that a pilot program for the Tesla Semi is now under development at Gigafactory 1, sorry, Giga Nevada, implying that things are going well. This person tweeted, a new nugget, they say, pilot line for Semi coming together. All right, not the longest of tweets. But it's a good bit of info, says Clean Technica. This person also provided insight on other factors in the past year, so they're a re reasonably reliable source. Vehicle production line development in Fremont and the Model Y was rolling out, and also the use of Tesla's Lathrop facility northeast of Fremont as a parts supply facility for vehicle casting. Uh, this person's talked about. He's also primarily provided insight on battery production. This person on Twitter first responded to a discussion about battery production at Gigafactory back in September 2019. And you can absolutely guarantee that if Tesla could track down who this person was, they would have worked their last day at Tesla. I think you'll find, my friend, the only person on the team that is allowed to tweet on behalf of Tesla, well, that would be the person who flies in the private jets, not somebody who makes the batteries. I'm sure it's a pseudonym or I'm sure it's a, a fake name or, or it might not even be a real account. I don't know. It might just be somebody who's good at guessing. But this person has got form semi truck pilot line being made in Nevada for those vehicles. Look, they got the room. So why not? Talking of gigafactories, British Vault is a company that's pleased to announce they say they've signed an agreement with the Welsh government as they work together on a commercially viable gigafactory in Great Britain. 
30 gigawatt hours of production every year. A solar plant going in as well at an old RAF base in the Vale of Glamorgan in South Wales. After six months of planning, they narrowed down South Wales from over 40 locations uh, because of things like import-export accessibility, uh, the labour market, skilled staff that's available in South Wales, and geographical proximity to the kind of customers and industrial companies who would want access to what's coming out of a gigafactory. Well, both parties have now signed this agreement to collaborate on building the first full cycle battery cell gigafactory here in the UK, subject to a bit of UK government funding uh, through a fund uh, to produce uh, lithium-ion uh, cylindrical cells and pouch cells if you're interested for the automotive market. I wonder which car maker will be buying those cells. We shall have to wait and see. Well, uh, they say the trouble that's surrounding the Tesla Gigafactory in Germany rumbles on, and it does by the look of it. Plenty of drone videos on YouTube will show quick progress, but behind the scenes, according to local media reports, all is not as well as it may seem. The company charged with covering the water requirements for Giga Berlin has stopped the planning process at the moment, says the website Electrive. The regional broadcaster RBB was reporting on this in Germany, uh, citing an internal letter that's gone around the Water Association. At the heart of the problem seems to be unsigned contracts from Tesla and future estimations of what will be needed. Not necessarily what will be needed by Tesla, but... I guess it's kind of a, a backhanded compliment in that they think the Tesla facility going up in Germany is going to attract so many new people and businesses who will want to set up other more factories or facilities in that area. Maybe it could be a real hub for production or, or industry or any you know associated industries or something. That's great for business, great for local employment, but not so great when they're trying to work out how much water the local area is going to need. And it's a strange old thing to hold up the Gigafactory, but I've got to be honest, even though these permits are still pending, it's not really holding up progress. Tesla has been struggling with these permits for months now. The environmental group that objected to the plans forced Tesla to redraft their planning permission. Uh, one concern was the factory's water consumption. Tesla reduced that in application documents subsequently. But now it seems to be the concern of, well, what will we need in the long term if, if Tesla attract other like-minded people? You've got to say you got a fair old set of kahunas if you're Tesla for going ahead and building the factory without all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. All right, maybe this is how all big business works, and I'm being naive, but maybe they're, they, there's no absolutely no suggestion that the this is causing delays or that they're, you know the, the plant is going to be off or anything like that, but just interesting that uh, they didn't wait to get all their ducks in a row before digging that first bit of soil they're right okay we'll work it out along the way maybe it's an interesting insight into the way they do it the business mentality the speed at which it's going as well uh, i did say when they announced germany was going to be the home of the, the next gigafactory a couple of times on this podcast i did say you know obviously delighted that they're making one in europe i worried for european bureaucracy i'll leave it there china gigafactory done in a year to the day funnily enough europe different beast but looks like it's moving pretty quickly long may it continue let's talk about another german company volkswagen got a new charging service they've called we charge and it basically gives you access to a existing public charging stations they're not built anything of their own uh, volkswagen is rolling out the we charge service to coincide with the launch of the id family quick side note the ID3 on sale today. Uh, the WeCharge program allows access all over Europe to 150,000 charging stations. Customers have a choice of three tariffs, and you can use the Ionity high power charging network on this as well. You can book it and use it from mid August. There's a free basic tariff, no monthly fee. It provides access to the charging network via a single charging card. So if you rarely use these high-powered chargers, it's just good to have access to them when you need them. 
There's a WeCharge Go tariff, which offers lower prices for individual charging processes and is good for regular users of high-powered chargers. And there's WeCharge Plus, the top tariff for frequent drivers, paying €30 a kilowatt hour on Ionity in Germany, and therefore a pretty attractive price. And that is, you know what I mean, look, if someone's gone to the expense of putting in charging networks that are you know 150 or 350 kilowatts charge speed i got no problem with them charging a fair price or even a slightly inflated price for the added convenience when you go out for a meal and you have somebody else cook the meal for you you have somebody else bring it to your table you have somebody else take it away and somebody else do the washing up you don't expect to pay the same price as you would have if you bought the ingredients and cooked it for yourself. So I don't mind motorway service stations charging a little bit more. It, it, you know what? I know some people have a real problem with the pricing of Ionity, but you know you kind of you get what you pay for, and it's good stuff in the right location. And you know it's using the Big Mac analogy. You just don't eat a Big Mac for dinner every day. You wouldn't use that kind of service to charge your EV day in, day out. But occasionally, okay, there's nothing wrong with, with fast charging a car on, on an expensive network if it gets you where you want to go many, many times cheaper than paying for petrol or diesel. Final story today with the most recent step into electrifying their lineup, Jeep have a plug-in hybrid solution with the Jeep Renegade, which uh, when I first talked about this months ago, when they first announced it, I called it the 4XE, which I thought was a pretty cool name. That's a cool name, 4XE. And then somebody replied and was like, duh, you're an idiot. If you see 4X4 on a page, how do you say out loud? 4x4. So how do you say this out loud? 4xE which sounds weird coming out of your mouth. The Renegade 4 by e 4 by e Sounds like Kumbaya, doesn't it? Uh, it's it's weird. Uh, okay, that's strange. Anyway, the Renegade 4 by e uh, uh, is a 1.3-litre turbo petrol engine, electric motor on the rear axle with an 11.4 kilowatt-hour battery, mid-20 mile something on all-electric range. 180 brake horsepower engine, 60 for the motor. So actually ending up a pretty pokey little beast, this thing. It'll be doing some great off-roading because of the electric power and the torque. Not to 62 in 7.5 seconds, 81 miles an hour in electric power alone. And the Renegade 4XE da -da -da -dun, arrives in showrooms in the UK in September, priced... Uh, <laughs> from £32,600 on the road. Whatever it's called. 4xe, 4xe, who knows? Uh, somebody does. Uh, someone's decided. And uh, it looks like for somebody somewhere, uh, that's going to be the right choice of Jeep for them to buy. Thank you for listening today. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Email is hello at evnewsdaily.com. Leave a comment on the YouTube show and I will reply and get back to you if it's a question or a comment. You know, it really helps to get reviews on Apple Podcasts to help grow this show because other people see what you write and they may be more inclined to hit subscribe. And it is, you know, if you do hit subscribe in your podcast app, whether you use your app or your baked in podcast app on, on Apple or Android or you use a third party one. Personally, I use Overcast for podcasts. How about you? Got any recommendations? I'd always like to see if there's a better app that I, I could be using. But if, if you're not already, if you're trying out the podcast, hit subscribe and get it every day, first and free and automatically. And thank you very much to my Patreon supporters, premium partners, Phil Roberts, Brad Crosby, Avid Technology, Brightsmith Group, Porsche of the Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, and now NationalCarCharging.com and Aloha Charge. Have a wonderful day. Catch you tomorrow. And remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.